<coughs> All right, if there are no questions, we'll continue today's topic with processes. In other words, we are moving our topic finally from files to processes. Now you might see all these little other things, you know, malloc, free, heap, stack, and so on and so forth. Um, I really don't think those are systems programming concepts. Uh, we can talk about it a little bit you know, when it is appropriate. But what I do want to talk about is this particular topic, it's topic 15. It's about multi-programming in Unix, process creation and termination, and process communication and synchronization. Um, this is the first slide. We started to take a look at this one last time. We didn't really go much. Uh, we didn't really go um, much into the thing. I only uh, the last thing I said was to focus on section three because that's what we'll be talking about today. On Monday, we also talked about the trade-offs between having a single thread, single process program, trying to do you know trying to handle multiple connections to multiple clients versus one process per connection. That's what we talked about on Monday. And the bottom line is, if you have one process per connection, your program is easier to write, it is easier to debug, and this program is definitely, quote unquote, easier. But you are, you are wasting systems resources, because now you have one process per, co per connection, and the overhead of a process would be the stack, at least, uh, the static area of your variables, and you know there are a few other things that will be using up you know system resources as well. So the trade-off is that, <coughs> but sometimes it makes sense to use one process per something. So that's why we have to talk about um, how to create processes. So it's helpful to pre create processes from a running process. You know, for example, Apache can create a new process to handle a new connection every time a client connects to the server. Apache actually has a much more complicated way to create a new process because one single Apache process can actually handle multiple threads and each thread con uh, handles you know, each one connection. You can actually do a configuration with Apache to control you know, how many connections per process and then up to how many processes to pre-spawn so that you know, when you have like a, a, a burst of incoming connections, then you don't have to wait for the processes to, to start up, you know, to, to, um, to multiply because you already have the processes in place to handle a certain number of connections already. But that's a little bit out of the scope of this class, you know, how to work with Apache. Furthermore, a Unix system starts with a single process initially. In other words, when your kernel starts up, it starts up one single process. So every other process is basically a child process or grandchild, you know, or a descendant process from that one single process. A mechanism must be provided to create all the processes of a normal running Linux system. Even the use of the emperor's end symbol in the CLI translates to a system call to create a new process. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at you know, what I mean by the emperor's end. So we'll go ahead and just, just, just start up. I think LibreOffice may not be a good example because it's, it's spins off. Well, it, it is a good. Okay, so I just started up LibreOffice, and you can see how the command prompt or the command line interface doesn't give the prompt back to me anymore. That's because the program is now running. And until I either close LibreOffice or type Control C to stop it, or type Control Z to pause it. I won't get my command, the, uh, the prompt of the command line interface back. So let's go ahead and close LibreOffice and then switch back to the terminal and I have my um, prompt back. Is that okay so far? But I can also do this. If you put an ampers end at the end of a command, it's telling bash, which is the shell you know, interface, that start up this program but run it as a different process. In other words, this is a process that is not um, a part of the bash process itself anymore. It is on its own, it is parallel. So if you do something like this, and I switch back to the prompt, um, the, the command line interface, I have my prompt back. Because now the bash process is its own process, and the LibreOffice process is also its own process, and they are parallel. Are we doing okay so far with these concepts? And you can use foreground to bring it back to basically you know, attach the 
command line interface you know, back to the LibreOffice process in this case. All right. So the first call you need to learn is called you know fork. The system call to create a new process is fork. F O R K. It's a very primitive system call, which means in assembly you know, language you can actually also use int dollar uh, zero x eight zero to create a new process. The fork call does not have any parameters. Now that's kind of interesting because you would kind of imagine that you know well don't we need to supply some sort of parameter to control you know how to spin off a new process? And the answer is no. But it does have meaningful return values. If fork returns zero, it means you are the child process. It is the new process that fork creates. If it returns negative one, it means fork has failed and you are the quote unquote parent process. But since no child process is created in the process, you are still basically the process that attempted to you know, create a new process. And you can use erNum you know, to see the reason, which also means you can use p error to print out the message, to print out exactly why the fork has failed. Otherwise, it is the process. Uh, otherwise means it is not zero and it's not negative one. Then that particular return value is the PID or the process ID of the child process. Okay, so let's kind of stop here and just you know, rethink about you know, what this means. You have a program. You, you, you have a program and it is being run as a process. At one point, you want to say, okay, I want to create a new process from this one. The new process is basically a clone of the process itself. In other words, when you use fork, you are not saying, I'm bash, I want to start LibreOffice. When you are using fork, you are bash, and you're saying, I'm going to create a new process that is also bash. In fact, it is an exact copy of the first one, you have the same global variables, you have the same everything, except then how do you how can you tell which one is which one? Because you have the original process and you have a new process that is a clone of the original process. The only way you can tell is to use the return value of fork. If fork is returning zero, it means you are the child process. You are the new process, you are the clone. If it is returning negative one, it means something has gone wrong. But if it's <laughs> returning anything other than zero or negative one, then you are the parent process. And the return value is a PID or process ID. So we can use that PID to uniquely identify the process that you have just created. So that you can either kill the process later on, or you can communicate with the other process using the PID. Are we doing OK so far with these concepts? So does the child know its parent process somehow? Um, it doesn't know that. There is another call, if I remember correctly, that the child process can use to tell who is its parent process. All right. So what we'll do is we'll take a look at a very simple program. This is the entire program. <clears throat> and you can just copy and paste it and you know, see it run. But what I'll do is I will just go ahead and go through this program uh, line by line. Okay, this part here, you know, get char, is just reading a single character from standard in. In other words, all it is doing is to delay the process. Okay, it gives me one chance to stop, and then I press the enter key, then it will continue execution. I do not use a conditional statement. Instead, I store the return value of fork into a variable. Then I can use it in a switch statement. The switch statement, you know, handles the three cases that we just mentioned. If it is case zero, I'm I will be the child process. So I will just go ahead and print out the message and say, hey, I'm the child process. And then forever sleep. In other words, the child process doesn't go away. It is stuck in an infinite loop. And the only thing it does in the infinite loop is sleep one, which means you know, we are not doing anything in, this, in, this, in the child process. If um, fork returns negative one, then I am the parent but I am also encountering a problem, and that's why I'm using p error to identify what the problem is so that you know, we can figure out you know, why, the, why a new process could not be created. The default means if I get anything other than zero or one, 
I would print out that I am the parent. The child process is percent D, and the child PID is printed out, you know, as a number. And also that one is going to sleep forever, so that we can also PS. PS is a command in Linux. It lists the processes that are currently running. Are we doing okay so far with um, this sample program? Okay. If we're okay with this sample program, we'll go ahead and just run it. And also later on, when we run this program, we'll also use this particular command to see how we can visualize the, the, the child process and the parent process and a few other things. Any questions at this point? Questions? If there are no questions, we'll go ahead and type this program. The wrong folder. I know for the most part I can just copy and paste, you know, but there are certain things that I cannot copy and paste, so I'm just gonna retype it. This is the way I usually write my program. I don't really put in the details until later on. I just you know, create the skeleton first. So this way I don't forget the break statements later. <clears throat> Everybody has a different way to do it. You know, this is just the way that I that is effective for myself. Well, here's a question that you guys think you can think about before we start to run the program. When we run this program, what do you think will appear on the, in the console at standard out? In other words, the, the question is, what is file descriptor one of the parent process, and what is file descriptor one of the child process? They would be the same, exactly. So they're both mapping to the same terminal, the same TTY device. So that's why you know, we will actually see both messages you know, one following the other. So we'll take a look at that too. Parent, but there's a problem here. So let's say PR, parent. And then we can say parent, parent child PID equals percent D. And that's child. waiting for me to press the you know, press one key, the enter key will do fine. And you can see that um, this is all that it's going to print. You can see that both the parent and the child process, they use the same uh, SDD out. Standard, standard in and standard out are basically shared for the two processes. Well, how do we share this you know, when there's input? I mean, you have two processes attached to the same teletype device. Printing is not a problem because they, would, they can just clobber each other's output, you know, so in the end, you, we will get the output from both programs. But what if we're waiting for the input? Bash is actually pretty smart. It will stop one and only have the other one you know, to have to own the terminal at the time so you can, you can actually use standard in for a particular process even though you only have one terminal. But for this program, that's not important because you know, we just want to see how can we see that this, these are processes that are related to each other. Now, you want to pay some attention to the process ID of the child because we want to find out you know, where this child is. So what we want to do now is to run the program or run a command called PS, or before you run it, you can also use a man page so that you know what PS stands for. PS, I think, stands for process status, okay? but you know, these acronyms you know, were never fully explained in the 
Unix type you know, operating systems. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and print, use a ps dash a. Dash a means you know we want to look at all the processes in the system, not just you know processes started up by this particular bash. Um, we can also use dash dash forest. Now dash dash forest is an interesting one because it will display in a semi graphical way how processes are related to each other, and we'll, it will be clear you know how. Okay. So do you guys see how everything, the, the, the backslash and also the underscore symbol here? That's a approximation of the usual you know, branching in a, in a graphical screen. It's basically saying you know, uh, ksoft IRKD, which is kernel soft interrupt daemon, is a child process of kthread d, which is kernel thread daemon. So it's trying to display the relationships of all of these processes. Let's go ahead and try to find our process. The process that we started up is fork. Okay? You can see that there are two fork processes here. The second one, which is the child process, we can identify that by its PID, is a sub-process or a child process of the process with a PID of 3648. Now, the child process, 3648, is itself a child process of 3160, which is the process responsible for bash itself. So we, you can have a hierarchy of you know, parent-child relationship when it, when it comes to processes. Are we doing OK so far with the concept of processes and how to start up a new process from an existing process? Is that good? OK. <clears throat> Switching back to here, it says, you know, how, but how do we you know, get rid of a process? Because now we, we have two processes. You can use one of two ways. One is to use the kill all program. The kill all program, let me just go man kill all. The kill all program can kill processes by name. In other words, in this particular case, the name of the process is fork. So you can say kill all fork then it will locate all the processes with a name of fork and kill them all. The other way to kill a process is to kill by the process ID. So I can say kill, was it 3650? That's the PID of the child process. So I can kill that. Now when we go to PS again and look for fork, then we can see that one is called defunct. Okay? Defunct means that the child process is killed but because the parent process is still around, the child process is basically a quote unquote zombie at this point. <laughs> yep. So if you look at the one that's Chrome just below there, it has one that's defunct. Mm -hmm. And they're not, in a, they don't look like they're branched out. Is there, why are they, why does it mean that they're just on top of each other? Okay, Chrome has, you know, in Chrome, if I remember correctly, each tab has its own process. So this means, you know, this is probably one tab of Chrome. Let me see, Chrome has two tabs at this point. So I'm assuming this is one and this is the other one. The defunct one, you know, can be one that existed before. Yep. The defunct one is actually the one that you have in the background. That I have in the background. Yeah, if you go to your, that, the one you have in the background right there, it, it swaps it. Let's let's take a look again and look at. Chrome. There are two no Chrome processes that are parallel to each other. There's one here and there's another one here too. Those top level processes may be the tabs, but I do not know how Chrome organizes the child processes, so it's pretty hard to, you you know, to explain that. If you in Chrome, there's a thing you can look at to break out what processes are in them. Say again? Yeah. So if you go to Chrome and mm -hmm. then you click on the wrench, there's a, uh, I forget what it's called, there's an option to see what the different processes are. There's a process manager. Yeah. Would it be under preferences? Under tools? Mm -hmm. Task manager. Yeah. Well, according to this, there are only three tasks, but how the tasks map to processes is another question because it doesn't show the uh, the process ID. I guess I can change process ID. There we go. 
that is useful because now we can actually identify which process is which one. So we have you know module zero two two five has one you know this tab has its own process, and then the other one you know, which is four has its own process. But that only accounts for three processes altogether. Um, when we look at this this terminal here, we have six. So let's see. So we can account for the top three. Nope. Take it back. Yeah, this is 30, 87. Top one and the last two. The yeah, top one and then the last two. So this one, you know, this Chrome, I cannot explain what it is. It's, it's some kind of internal mechanism that is not reported by GNOME's own task manager. Very cool. I did not so know that. Stats for nerds. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, maybe that is useful. Because it's telling me how much memory is being used. And those are all your process IDs on the left. Exactly. So the sandbox helper is using one process. Tab fork, tab about memory. Uh, this is the new one that I created. So Zygot is another one. What is that? Zygot is a. Uh, Zygot. Zygot. It's, Zygot. It's, uh, it's something to do with biology. <laughs> I think it has to do with uh, reproduction. Yeah. Google says it's a process that listens for spawn requests from a master process and forks itself in response. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's kind of like a mini server. It's, it's means of you know, additional processes. Very good. So, okay, kind of um, getting back to my question, if you also look on the where you, where you have your bash and then the ps command and the less, mm -hmm. it lines them up in a line instead of forking them out. Is that? You mean these two? Yeah, what does it mean when they're just on top of each other and they're not forked out? They are siblings. They're siblings? Yeah, in this case, it means ps is a child process of this bash, and so is less. It is also a child process <coughs> of this bash. Okay. And that's because I use the pipe symbol. When I use the pipe symbol, it means the, the, the standard out of one of the first process becomes the standard in of the second process. So the two processes are siblings because they both need to run at the same time and they're both child processes of the bash shell that started up you know, this command. That's a good question. Okay. Any other questions you know, from this particular view? So I would, I definitely recommend the use of the dash dash you know, forest option. It takes up more space, you know, because you know it wants to list the relationship of all the processes. But at the same time, you know, it can you can tell you know how the processes are related to each other. The child you know, parent you know, relationship is displayed you know, very clearly here. Any questions about this? No questions. Okay. How do I kill fork then? I'm still, you know, fork still has, you know, this one is default. If I kill the parent process, it automatically kills the child process. So if I kill 3648, the other one will be gone automatically. So kill 3648. And if I look for fork, there's none left. All right. Well, but what, what about this? What if I run fork? It will create both the child and the parent process. What if I, the first one I kill is the parent process? I already told you, if you kill the parent process, the child process will die automatically. Yep. Why do I think that you're quickly turning us all into mass murderers? <laughs> <laughs> you got to have some fun of program. Well, let's take a look. OK, now we have a parent process. The parent process is 30, 3844. So kill 3844, and you can see that both processes will terminate. Now we can confirm that both processes have terminated by making sure that, oh, we still have the child process going. So I was wrong. When you, when you kill the parent process, it doesn't automatically kill the child process. Well, it, didn't, it did not because you know, 3846 is still here, and I think that's the child process. Because the output here, you know, that's the child process is 3846. It becomes an orphaned process. It has no parent process anymore. This is just sounding more and more correct. 
<laughs> Unfortunately, there's no way to adopt the process. In other words, you cannot re-establish someone as the parent of a child process. So that process is now completely independent, and sometimes we call those, you know, daemons. You know, basically they are, you know, process that has that have no uh, parent process anymore. They're completely independent. All right. No, because I only get the char before the fork operation. The execution point of both the child process and the parent process are the same. They are both returning from the fork, except the return value of the fork will be different. So the parent gets the PID of the child process, and then the child process gets zero. So at that point, you know, they will start to deviate depending on your conditional statement or your switch statement in this case, then they will start to deviate. But before that point, you know, there's only one process up to the fork. But after the fork, then they, they can diverge from there. Okay, the next question is, now that we, had, we know how to you know, spin off additional processes, do they share anything? Well, the answer is they do share, quote unquote, share things but they also have clones of each other. They have copies of the same stuff, but they're not shared. All right, so let's take a look. You know, if you look, if you look into man to fork, you know, it would also explain all of these things. But particularly, these are very important. The PID, obviously, of the two processes have to be different, because otherwise, if they have the same process ID, then you cannot distinguish which one is the parent and which one is the child process. So I think this one goes without saying. <coughs> The parent's PID is the child's parent PID. Okay, that's just a terminology. PPID is the parent process ID. Resource, re, resource utilizations are reset in the child process. That means the child's process will start with no pending signals, even if the parent has a pending signal. Now, how can you have a pending signal? Do you guys still remember? Yep. Well, if you, block, say, if you temporarily block signals, Yep, because you can set up a mask to block, you know, signals. So those signals become, because they, beca they are not ignored, they become pending signals. So if, if your fork is executed in a part of the program where some signals are blocked, then the signals are basically blocked, but as soon as you unblock the signal, they will come in. The child process does not inherit pending signals. <coughs> um, nor does it, you know, uh, inherit timers. It does not inherit outstanding asynchronous I.O. operations. In other words, your read-write operations, they do not inherit those. The child does not receive a signal when the parent dies. In other words, a child process would have no idea when the parent process dies. But the, the reverse is not true. When the child process dies, the parent actually gets a signal to say that one of your child processes have died. And if the signal is sick child, the child process is created with a single thread, so that means if your parent, uh, if the parent process is multi-threading, when you use fork, then you only have a single thread left in the child process. It will be the thread that is responsible for the fork operation. Now, this is a good time to give you a little picture of you know what I what I just talked about. And can't find a marker. Oh, we got two here. All right. Okay, let's say one box is one process. A single process can have multiple threads, just like that. Each thread, we can look at each thread as a function that is running or executing independent to the other functions. In other words, from your main, you can use multi-threading and say, okay, I'm calling, you know, subroutine F as a single thread, and subroutine F will be a thread all on its own, and its execution is quote unquote independent to the other threads. You can also use G as the entry point of your another thread, and then use, you know, um, subroutine H as another thread. So now we have three threads; they're all executing at the same time. 
So let's just say that your uh, subroutine G is the one that encounters a fork call somewhere in this execution. When this fork returns, you will have a trial process, assuming that you can create a new trial process, then you have a new trial process. But in the new trial process, you will still have main, but you will only have this thread left, where the fork is returning. The other two threads, F and H, will not be present in the trial process. Is that okay? In other words, only the fork, the thread that is responsible for the fork, is the only thread left when you have a trial process created by a parent process. Now this part you know, may not be important because we haven't really talked about multi-threading, but once you have multi-threading in your program, that can become very <coughs> important. <coughs> the trial process does inherit open file descriptors. Now this is one of the most important part of um, multi-processing multi because they all have the same file descriptors. If you have sockets open in a parent process, the trial process will also inherit the same sockets which can be handy in a way, but it can also be bad in a way, because now you can have two, process, two processes trying to interact with the same sockets at the same time. The typical way to do this is you know, one of them will give up control you know, of that particular you know, file descriptor and close it, so the other one will be responsible to handle it. Yep. So the file descriptor is, in essence, clone, not share. If, you, if, if, the, if the child closes the file descriptor, the parent can still write to it? That is correct. Okay. So th the file descriptor is cloned, but what the file descriptors are describing, that is shared. In other words, the, if you have file descriptor 8 that is hooked up to a particular socket in the parent process, the child process will, when the child process is created, it will also have file descriptor 8 mapped to the same socket. But if the parent process decides to close file descriptor 8, then the parent will lose access to the socket represented by file descriptor 8, but the child will continue to have access to the socket represented by file descriptor 8. How does, um, how does the uh, process on the other side of the socket interact? I mean, it, it, it if it sends something through the uh, socket, does it go to the buffer? Does it go to the, the read buffers of both of the endpoints? Um, there's only one buffer because one file descriptor is the same. It's the same socket with the same file descriptor, right? And therefore, there's only one buffer. Problems can happen when both processes start to read or read from or write to that socket. But as long as one of them is smart, let's say the parent says, you know, I'm spinning off this process so that the, the child process can handle this particular connection. So at that point, as long as the parent process doesn't, doesn't do any read or write operation and just close the file descriptor, then there's no, no harm is done. Because the child process can immediately start to read or write using that particular file descriptor. So as long as you know, there's, a, there's a, an agreement not to do read or write operation you know, from both processes at the same time, there should be no problem. Now, if they do try to read and write at the same time, then it becomes a problem of interlocking because it's the same buffer. If the parent gets the read operation first, then the parent will read you know, the number of bytes that the parent wants to read. And then, for whatever reason, if there's some sort of um, interleaving of execution and the child process has control again and reads some more, then they'll be reading as far as the socket is concerned, it is still being read sequentially. The bytes are still being read sequentially, except it is dispersed to different processes. So each one will only get a part of the message. <laughs> and there's no control you know, who gets which part because the scheduling between the two processes are not arranged. It, it is asynchronous. With the exception of you know, if your child process and the parent process have explicit communication and synchronization, then yes, you can still share the same file descriptor in a sensible way. But if you don't enforce the synchronization, then you know you can both read and write, but it won't make any sense anymore. <laughs> yep. 
so uh, the child process only gets a single thread that, that spun it off, but now if, if other threads of the parent process before the fork command open file descriptors, the child still inherits those file descriptors even though... That is correct. Yep. Any other questions? Yep. So if the child's main returns, does that count as dying? Does it count as dying? It's not getting killed for one, but it will become defunct and yes, because the, the process is still terminating. Regardless of the reason, if the child process is terminating, the parent process will still get a signal. Good question. Any other questions? Now, the last part here is also very important. The parent and the child processes do not share any memory space. So what that means is if you have global variables, the parent has its own global variables, the child has its own global variables. Initially, right after the fork operation, the variables will have the same values. If the parent process has a global variable x having a, con having a value of 12, the child process will have its own global variable x having exactly the same value. But if, if the parent changes the, global, the value of global variable x, it doesn't change the global variable x in the child process because they are two completely separate copies at that point. The child process is a clone of the parent process. As a result, the global variables are not shared. They're simply cloned or copied before the child process starts execution. Okay. Which makes communication a little bit hard because now how do you, you know, synchronize the execution between the child process and the parent process? Hi. Hmm? Hi. Same thing. The heap is replicated, the stack is replicated up to the point of the fork operation. But would they point to the right place? Yep, they still point to the same place. In, in, in other words, if you look at the entire memory space used by a process, your global variables, your static local variables, your stack, your heap, and so on, everything is duplicated. So if you have been using malloc and free or in C++ new and delete in the parent process before the fork, the child process inherits all of that stuff too. So all your pointers will still be pointing to the same place and the memory content will still be at the same place. Will be duplicated though, right? They are duplicated, which means if, you, if the parent process makes any changes using you know, mal, uh, free or malloc, it does not the, the changes will not be mirrored to the child process and vice versa. So the pointers are really updated to the new place? Correct. Okay. But the new place has exactly the same layout and therefore right. you know, it still works. Right. Yep. Well, you still get the initial copy. Yes. If you start messing with it, then you're, the parent's not going to see what the child's doing and the child's not going to see what the right. parent's doing. Yep, exactly. It's just like, you know, it's just like making a clone because, you know, you have exactly the same stuff, the same state as, you know, the moment where the cloning process happens. But then after that, you have two in the independent copies of exactly the same thing. So each, the, the, the original and the clone can do whatever they want and the changes won't be reflected to each other's state. They become independent after that. Are we doing okay so far with um, this section, section 3.2? Inter-process communication. In other words, I have two processes. How do I make them talk to each other? Now, this one is a little bit kind of complicated because we have used, we can use pipes. This is one way for these two to communicate, to talk to each other. So this is a program that allows you know, two programs to talk to each other. It's a, it's a snippet of code. It's not an entire complete program. So what, what we have here is um, descriptors you know, up here. And then we have pairs of descriptors as an array down here. And we use the pipe system call to associate 
the two um, file descriptors of an array of two integers and create a pipe this way. Now, what is a pipe? A pipe is a concept <coughs> where one file descriptor is a output and whatever, okay, let me change that. When you run the pipe command, like this one here, just gonna highlight it. When you run the pipe command, it will create a pipe. When we create a pipe, it means it's going to create two file descriptors. One file descriptor is serving as an input, one file descriptor is serving as an output. In other words, you have to write to one file descriptor, but whatever you write to that one file, the first file descriptor, will automatically become the output of the second file descriptor. Are we doing okay so far? You, we are creating two endpoints of a pipe, and each endpoint has its own file descriptor. Is that concept okay? Yes, no, kind of. <laughs> Can you say again what you said about the the uh, the input of one becomes the output of the other? Yes, because it, it's a pair. Okay. You are creating a unidirectional straw, basically. Right, right. One end of the straw has one file descriptor. The other end of the straw has another file descriptor. But if you write to one end of the file uh, of the straw, yeah. it comes out from the other end of the straw. Right. Okay. okay. And it's probably be best to look up you know, the pipe system call. You know, this is the pipe system call. Okay, the pipe system call creates a pipe, a unidirectional data channel. Now unidirectional means it is not bidirectional because sockets are bidirectional. Once we open up a socket, you can use the same file descriptor for read and also for write operations. In the case of a pipe, each file descriptor can only serve one single purpose. It's either the input or the output. The array file uh, pipe FD, which is the parameter you know, we are focusing on the first call here, is used to return two file descriptors referring to the ends of the pipe. The first one with a bracket zero refers to the read end of the pipe. So that's where you would you you can you have to use this for the read operation. And then the second one, uh, pipe FD bracket one, refers to the right end of the pipe, so you use the right call on the other side. Data written to the right end of the pipe is buffered by the kernel until it is read from the read end of the pipe. So basically the same thing that I just talked about, but this one you know, describes you know, exactly which one is which one. I just said that one is read and one is write. This one is, the, the description here is specific and says the first one is for reading purposes and the second one is for writing purposes. Are we doing okay so far with the concept of pipe itself? Well, let's go ahead and write a very simple program just so that we can confirm our understanding of the pipe concept. So test pipe. And I have to look up the header files. I can remember those things. It's UNISTD. That's all we need to create, you know, a pipe. <coughs> and I'm not even going to make this program very complicated. You know, this is all I'm going to. This is all that I'm going to do with this. Write to pipe FD bracket one because that's the right end of the pipe. And I just need to, you know, feed it something. So char. Okay, we'll just write the character X here. single byte, and then I will read from the other end, so read pipe FD bracket zero, and we'll just go ahead and read it into another chart, so read CH here, and just read in one byte, and that's it, that's my program. All I want to do is to confirm whatever I wrote to pipe FD bracket one 
is the one is the same thing that I'm reading back from pipe FD bracket zero. That's all that I want to do. This program has no output, so the only way to make sense of this program is to run it in GDB. And personally, I think it, this beats you know having to include stdio.h and then have all the printf statements and whatnot. One printf statement. You can. Yeah, I just need one to <laughs> confirm that, right? right? I'm trying to get used to GDB instead of printfs. Our program, and we'll go ahead and put a breakpoint on line nine first. Run the program. We are not on line nine at this point. Um, pipe FD really has you know uninitialized values right now. You can see that these are like totally unreasonable, you know, file descriptors. So we will go ahead and say next. Next is similar to step, except it does not get into the subroutine itself. Typically, system calls like pipe or fork and stuff like that, you cannot really step into anyway. But sometimes, if you have the debug uh, symbols also installed you know, in your Linux distribution, you can actually trace into that code as well. So if you single step, use uh, lowercase s, you can actually get into the system you know, uh, subroutine itself. Then things can get you know, confusing, it's very time consuming. But in this case, you know, I'm just doing, using next so that the pipe call is now done. And I can print it out. Now we have much more reasonable values, seven and eight. Um, single step through the ch equals you know, x, and then we'll um, use next to go through the write operation, and then we'll use n also to get through the read operation. The question now is, what is in ch? Ch has x because you know that's the from the assignment statement, but we also want to find out what is in read ch or read ch is also x. So I just confirm that the pipe operation is operates the same the way it is supposed to. Are we doing okay with this program? Now this is the kind of thing that I want people to do as they read the notes. You know, is to understand the concept first, and then read, and then just write a program as simple of a program as possible to confirm your understanding of the concepts. Doesn't have to be fancy. Doesn't need to have like user input and stuff like that. Something as simple as this is already more than sufficient. So what are we doing here? I just confirmed you know, the operation of pipe. So what we have here are two, two pipes. In other words, we have four file descriptors in the process. Okay? The first one is for communication from parent to child. The second one is for communication from child to parent. In other words, I am trying to facilitate bi-directional communication between the child and the parent process. So the child process or the parent process can send a, you know, some um, query to the child process. The child process can get a message and then reply back to the parent process. And then we have a fork operation at this point. The fork operation is simply, you know, um, starting a new process. Now remember the child process also inherits exactly the same file descriptors as the parent process. In other words, everything that we did with the pipe is also going to be present in the child process. The child process automatically has the, has the four endpoints that we have created by the, the, by the two pipe calls. Are we still doing okay so far with the concept? If the child process ID, now this is you know really bad code because I'm assuming it's not returning negative one. <laughs> if it does return negative one, it will still say you know it, this will still be true because negative one is non-zero. But basically, if it is non-zero and it is not an error, I'm the parent process. So from the parent's process perspective, um, the pipe that the 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 end that I should write to from me is going to be parent to child one because that's the right end of the pipe that is responsible to go from the parent to the child process. Does that make any sense? And then the other way means, you know, when the child process wants to talk to me, this is the file descriptor that I should read from in order to receive communication from the child process. Yep. Mm -hmm. Are you just specifying those into uh, File descriptors just to make it more clear because yes. you just keep track and do Correct. it your own. Okay. Yep. 
I'm, I'm using you know, from me you know, file descriptor and to me file descriptor so that each process only has to deal with those two particular variables. No? And after this, you can also see that uh, from the scoping rules, this is one single scope, this is one single block. So when I get out of this single block here, these two global arrays, I mean these two local arrays will disappear. Now, but having the, the two arrays disappearing doesn't mean the file descriptors are gone. Because I still have from me and to me, you know, defined outside of the scope, so I can still refer to the correct file descriptors for communication purposes. So are we doing okay so far with this chunk of code, which creates, you know, the necessary pipes so that the parent and the child process can at least talk to each other using file operations or pipe operations? Is that okay? It's a very crude form of communication, but it is still a form of communication. Because as long as you can define a particular protocol for the parent and the child processes to talk to each other, then you can still achieve you know, synchronization between the two processes. Is that okay? So the rest of this slide really is just you know, replicating what I said earlier. While this solution works, it has potential problems. Particularly, both processes would use the same standard in, standard out, and standard er. We talked about it a little bit earlier. When both processes write to standard out at the same time, the output may be interleaved in any arbitrary order. When both processes read from standard in, the standard in corresponding to the console, only one process may get the foreground of the console. That part is enforced by bash. So if both processes try to read at the same time, Bash will just say bring one to the foreground so that it will get the input. Which one it is going to bring to the foreground depends on who gets to the read operation first. And that can be really arbitrary because it depends on you know, race conditions and a few other things. So you know it's, it's not a good thing when you have race conditions. How many people know what I'm talking about when I talk about race conditions? Sort of, okay. A race condition is basically, you know, the, the the effect of some code depends on who gets to a particular section of code first. And so, if the outcome of the race cannot be is not deterministic, then the program will behave undeterministically, which means it is very hard to debug that sort of programs. Yep. Are you saying R A C E race or race R A C E race? Yep. Like you know, driving uh, yeah. 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 So if they're sharing standard out, mm -hmm. you don't really have any way to know which one came to the foreground because you can't really print a message saying, "I'm going to ask you." I'm the one that's asking you for input. Yep, you are right. Now you can redirect the output of one to something else if you right. want to. I believe you can use dupe to do it. D U P is the command, you know, um, or the system call to do it. So you can read. You can make one process so that you can change its standard out to something else. But if you don't, then they will both be mapped to the same TTY terminal and you have no idea you know, which program sends you which output. And then the output can also interleave. So even if you say, you know, child, you know, colon something, parent colon something, they can be completely interleaved and garbled. Typically, you don't see the garbling because um, the time slicing of the kernel is happening with enough of a big slice where one single printf statement should be able to finish before the time slice expires. So that's why you usually don't see the interleaving. It's because you know each time slice is long enough to finish the dumping of one single message into the buffer. But that part cannot be guaranteed. So you can still potentially end up getting garbled output. Right, so we are now done with section three, and now we are moving on to threads. All right, what exactly is a thread? We talked about processes, and now we are talking about threads. A thread is a subunit inside a process. In other words, a process has at least one thread, but it can also have potentially have multiple threads. And it's not the other way around, okay? A thread cannot belong to two processes. Okay. The 
processes are not the only way to execute code concurrently. In fact, processes are very resource hungry because you are everything every time you start a new process, there's a whole lot of stuff being replicated. And inside the kernel, the data structure representing a process is also kind of big. And all that stuff you know has to be replicated every time you start up a new process. So as a alternative, you can use threads if you want to do parallel you know, type of coding. Um, all global variables, file descriptors, the heap and the stack are duplicated in, you know, when you use a uh, fork to create a new process. This also makes it somewhat difficult for processes to communicate because, you know, you can use a pipe or you can use a socket, but when you use a pipe or a socket for communication purposes, you also need some sort of parsing of the, of the protocol that you use between the child and the parent process. So that takes up, you know, quite a bit of code and it is not very, yeah, efficient. The alternative is to use what we call threads. So let's go ahead and talk about what a thread is. The state of a thread includes the following. Global variables, and these are things that are statically allocated. The heap, the space where objects are allocated dynamically. And the stack and the stack corner. These are where lo local variables, parameters, and many other states related to the subroutine are stored. Two threads of the same process will share global variables and the heap. The only thing that they do not share will be the stack. Okay. Let's stop here for a moment, and then we will talk about you know, why the stack is so important. How many of you took assembly language programming and, ex and in the assembly language programming class you learned how subroutines are tightly coupled to the concept of a stack? Okay. Most people who, take, you know, who took that class from you should know that. <laughs> if you take the class from somebody else, as long as they cover the instruction call and return, you should still understand that the stack is you know, very central to the concept of calling subroutines and returning from subroutines. So what that means is, I'm not gonna erase this one, I will use another part of the screen to do this. So what this means is, if you have a stack, which is you know, just basically a chunk of system memory, the way I draw a stack is like this. This direction goes to high memory addresses and this direction to low memory addresses. An empty stack is basically having the stack pointer pointing all the way to the top. That's, a, that's an empty stack. As you call subroutines and have local variables and have parameters and other things that you, can, that you put on the stack, the stack pointer will go lower and lower as you have you know, subroutines. In other words, if your call structure starts with a main program, main cos f, f cos g, and g cos h, then they will be consuming the stack in this particular order. Whatever belongs to main, the local variables will be up there. Whatever belongs to function f will be here. Whatever belongs to function g belongs here. And whatever belongs to h will go here. Okay? And that's how you know, a stack is used in the context of calling subroutines. Remember a little bit earlier what a thread is? A thread is basically a concurrent execution unit where it looks kind of just like a subroutine call. So that means if you want to have a parallel thread, let's say you know, the other thread starts with you know, um, T1 for thread one. That means it, in, it needs its own stack. This is the main thread. This is the thread that starts the execution. Every process has one default thread to begin with. But if you want to start a new thread, you need another stack. If you want to start up another thread, then you need another stack. Every thread has its own stack. So this way, this particular thread, which is represented by T1 as the entry point to the thread, it can call its own subroutines now. It can call its own subroutine F, and then call its own subroutine G, and so on. So these things will go up and down depending on the call and the return of the subroutines. The other thread T2, same thing. You can it can call its you know, function G, and fun, excuse me, function F, and then function G, and so on. 
So every thread has its own stack. What about global variables? Global variables are shared amongst all the threads of the same process. So that means you have a chunk of memory here that is dedicated to statically allocated variables. And then you have another chunk mem of memory here, which is corresponding to the heap, which is also what you use for um, in C++, new and delete. In C, it is malloc and free. But all of these are shared. This portion is shared. These are not. Each one is specific to a particular thread. It also goes without saying that the stack pointer is also independent. Each thread has its own stack pointer. Are we doing okay so far with the concept of a thread? Now the result of this is two threads cannot execute on two different machines because they have to share the static memory as well as the heap. But at the same time, they also share the sharing of global variables as well as the heap also make communication e easier in many ways. Yep. Uh, by stating that, does that mean that you could fork a process into two different machines? No, you cannot fork you know, into two, two different machines, but you can have two processes running on two different machines to communicate with each other by using sockets. And that's why sockets are so useful, because it allows cross-machine or cross-host communication. Whereas, you know, if you use pipes, you, they have to be on the same machine. Are we doing okay so far with the concept of a thread? Just in general. And this is also a good time for me to uh, advertise my own stuff. Merchandise. <laughs> Action figures of tag, right? <laughs> Is this solving the whole budget issue? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a big sale. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, so this is my own website. But for those of you who want to know a little bit more about multi-threading, but not in the context of you know, Unix or Linux, you can look into, let's see, it develops. And this is my own real-time kernel. And this one does not have multi-processing, it has multi-threading only. And if you look at the call to create a new thread, let's see, which one is it? Thread add. Okay, this is, you know, this is a you know, C function call to start up a new thread. It's, it includes several things. This is the entry point of the new thread. In other words, it's a function to, it's a pointer to a function to serve as an entry point of a, of a thread. You don't have to deal with the other ones much, except for the stack pointer. In other words, you have to allocate um, memory for the stack of this particular thread. So when you create the thread, you have to say, oh, for this particular thread, I want you to use this chunk of memory as a stack. In this case, you know, I have you know, a little bit more, you know, more stuff here because um, this is the data structure representing a thread, and inside, and I have a, a concept of queuing inside a single thread. Uh, it's in a round robin fashion, so that's why there's also a, a parameter for the queue because you have um, a thread can belong to a particular priority queue. This is not required reading, but for people who want to, you know, understand a little bit more about, you know, kernels multi-kernels, multi-threading, round-robin, preemptive thread change, priority queues, and stuff like that, you know, this is, I think it's a good introduction. Um, the kernel itself has a footprint of two kilobytes. Ap approximately two kilobytes. It's a little bit more than that, but not, not by much. That's and too big. <laughs> It is too big for certain architectures because some of the some of the variants of this architecture only has 512 instructions. <laughs> yes, so two kilobytes is already too big. It can run on the larger variants of that of the AVR you know, platform, but not on the smaller ones. The 50 cent MCUs. 
you were talking about? Mm -hmm. The 50 cent? Yeah, the 50 cent is. cannot run it. But if you get an $8 one, it, it has enough resources to do it. So getting back to the notes here, the next one. When do we use processes and when do, you, when do we use threads? If concurrent logic may need to execute on different machines, then you have no choice but to use processes. Because you can have one process to run on one machine, you can have another process to run on another machine, and they can communicate using sockets. When do we have stuff like that? I mean, you know, concurrent logic that need to run on different machines. It's typically a client, you know, a server-client relationship. But when do we have a quote unquote a single program that is broken up into two pieces where one piece executes on one machine and the other piece has to execute on a different machine? Distributed computing. Has anyone does anyone know how to do a GIS type programming? GIS stands for uh, geographical information systems? No? Okay. The most famous commercial package for GIS is ArcGIS, ArcGIS, A-R-C-G-I-S. And the code to deal with GIS is so proprietary that they do not want to distribute the DLLs with the product. Okay? <laughs> not the source code. I'm not talking about the source code of the proprietary code. I'm talking about the object code as you know, DLLs or dynamic, dynamically linked libraries. They don't even want to distribute that because you can also disassemble that code and figure out how it works. So it, they want to keep it in a, as a big, such a big secret that they want to run it as a remote thing. So here is your program, your application in GIS, and it needs to do a certain thing, and you're trying to call a subroutine to do it. But the manufacturer or the publisher doesn't want you, the developer doesn't want you to look at the code responsible for that. So now you have your own machine running your program on one side using a machine, and in order to complete the subroutine call, it sends over an RPC, a remote procedure call, to another machine that the publisher is hosting. So your subroutine call is now, quote unquote, across different machines. <laughs> the execution of the subroutine happens on this machine here, so that you have no idea what is the you don't even have access to the object code of that code. So there's no way you can disassemble and find out how it works. <laughs> when it's done computing, then the RPC will re quote unquote return, and then the return you know, value or return object will come back to your machine, so you can only, t you can only start the subroutine call and get th the result back, but the execution of the subroutine is actually on a different machine. In that case, you have no choice but to have two, at least two separate processes, because one process run on one machine, and the, uh, the, pro the other process run on a different machine. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how it's done. I mean, Visual Basic is built to allow and to encourage this type of uh, you know, uh, RPC or remote procedure calls. Yep. So anytime you're running that software, it forks it forks. It doesn't fork. It's it's actually every time you call a subroutine in this case, it initiates network connection to the other side. It's called an RPC or remote procedure call okay. because the the procedure call is no longer local to your process or even your own machine. It is actually going to another machine to complete the procedure call. If your concurrent logic needs to share complex data structure in memory, then it is very clear cut you know, threads should be used because threads can share global variables as well as the heap. So if you need like a binary search tree or anything that's complex, you know, threads can be a good way to go. Not all concurrent logic fall clearly into one or the other category. As a result, some concurrent logic can be implemented by multi-process or some other can be implemented by multi-thread solutions. It should be noted that concurrent logic can be implemented by a single thread of a single process, and we talked about this enough times already. You know, Squid is single process, single thread, and yet it is capable of communicating with a number of clients all at the same time efficiently. In terms of debugging, we talked about this already, 
multi-threading and multi-process each has its own challenges, but this part we haven't talked about. But a single thread and a single process program can be difficult to, to, to debug. The interaction of threads can, be, can lead to unreproducible and sporadic system symptoms due to the improper sharing of variables and objects. Let's talk about this one a little bit. And this is also a reason why you should not use global variables, unless you know what you're doing. <laughs> okay, let's think about something that is very simple. Let's, we're almost out of time. But I do want to show you what I mean by this. Accessories. Okay, so let's say in thread one, we have something that looks like this. If x is greater than y, do something. And then we have in thread two, we have something that looks like this, x plus equal to k, okay? Or something along that line. And x is a global variable in this case. Mm, do we have a problem here? Yeah. yeah. Potentially, we can have a problem because when we are evaluating this comparison um, operation or the comparison operator, halfway through the comparison, this can happen. So that means, you know, x, the value of x that you're using for the comparison may not be consistent. Now, what do, my, what, what do I mean by not consistent? Let's also say that, you know, the type of x is long, long, okay? just to make sure that the comparison cannot be atomic or the increment you know, cannot be atomic. So what this means is in order to do x plus equal to k, in terms of assembly instructions, it has to be split into several instructions. Okay? It has to be split into at least two add l instructions. One add l and one is ADCL add with carry long. Okay? So there are two operations to finish x plus equal k. At the same time, when we are comparing, it also requires multiple comparison instructions. So you have, you know, compare long, and then another compare long along with something else. After the first compare long instruction, which compares, you know, one part of x, you can have the threads to change. In other words, this thread runs out of time to execute, and it's time for the other thread to start execution. So now, you have a partial comparison done by the first thread, and then the second thread comes in and completely changes the value of x. And then it goes back to the first thread to finish up the comparison. So now, that what that means is in your first thread, you'll be using, x will be a part of the x before x plus equals k, and it will be a part of after x plus equals k. Now that can be a problem depending on where x was before, because if x is right uh, at the point of changing the sign of the, the value, then you can end up with a very strange value for comparison. Do you guys un understand what I mean by you know, flipping the sign? Because when you flip the sign, then the sign bit itself is going to be propagated. You know, you're changing from 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, in terms of binary representation. But if you, if half of the if half of x is before the increment and half of x is after the increment, then what you are really using for comparison in the first thread is neither. It's neither before the increment nor after the increment. It is a, it's, it's, basi it's basically a clobbered value of x. And in those cases, your program will break. It's gonna, you know, it's gonna you know, do something that is incorrect. The problem is not just that it is going to do something incorrect. What is the main problem of this whole setup? You'll never be able to reproduce it reliably to track it down. Exactly. It may happen once in a blue moon, depending on the frequency of you know, hitting this code and also hitting this code. Now, the frequency of hitting this code and you know, the first thread and the second thread depends on many, many other factors. Okay, if your program is in a particular mode, maybe it will never hit one of these codes. So it may not happen for years. Mm. And then one day you just have the condition where you know, the frequency of these two happening at the same time is increasing. Then you can have it every other second. <laughs> <laughs> and every time it happens, 
depending on whether you know, x is crossing over you know, from you know, negative to positive or vice versa, the symptom can be entirely different. So the program is not working, and the, the program is not working, but the period or the time between the time that it's not working is unpredict unpredictable. And not only that, the symptom itself is also all over the place because it depends on how the variable is getting corrupted. And that's the worst kind of problem you can encounter. Mm -hmm. We are already out of time today, so we'll go ahead and stop here, and then we'll continue from this point on Monday. I have a question for you. Um, yep. Can you have a little bit more going on my program? It's something I never checked on before. <laughs>